When classes began at Drexel University in Philadelphia on the morning of November 30th, 1984, students walking into Randall Hall made a gruesome discovery. Crumpled at the bottom of an outdoor stairwell underneath a gray jacket was the body of a young woman. She had cuts and bruising all over her face and she had a deep purple line that went all around her neck from where she had been strangled to death. She had no purse, no backpack, nothing to identify her. There was no evidence of sexual assault because she was fully clothed, although she was missing her shoes and socks. Police immediately cordoned off the area. Their first suspicion was this was a robbery that turned deadly. But right away, the police knew they were in for a very difficult investigation because one, there were no cameras inside or outside of Randall Hall, so they couldn't just review the footage to see what happened to Debbie. And two, there was a virtually unlimited number of suspects because Drexler University was not an isolated campus. Its buildings were integrated into West Philadelphia, and Randall Hall itself was located right along a known cut-through that residents that lived in and around Drexler would use almost every single day. And it was clear this young woman had not been killed in this stairwell. She had been killed elsewhere and then dragged a great distance, losing her shoes in the process before being dumped at this spot. But just a couple of hours after the body was discovered, the police received a lucky break when a young man who was combative and frantic rushed the closed off crime scene and demanded he be let through because he said he knew the identity of the dead girl. The police were immediately suspicious because they didn't even know who this dead girl was. So they pull the young man aside and they interview him and he tells police his name is Kurt Rayner, he's a student at Drexel University, and he believes the girl they had found, the dead girl, was his girlfriend, 20-year-old Debbie Wilson, who was also a student. And then he proceeded to give police a very long and complicated explanation of how he figured out the girl inside was his girlfriend. He said the night before he was with Debbie in Randall Hall in the computer lab in the basement. He said Debbie had had a big project that was due the next day and that he had offered to just keep her company while she worked. But by about 1.30 in the morning, Debbie still had a lot of work to do and Kurt said he was just really tired and didn't know if he could stay awake any longer. And so he asked Debbie if it would be okay if he took off early. Debbie said it was totally fine. She was used to working late at this computer lab. And Kurt, even though he wanted to stick around and walk her safely to her car when she was done, he felt like she was okay. And so he took off on his own. On his walk back to the dorm, Kurt said he passed by by a campus security guard and he actually asked him if he wouldn't mind checking on his girlfriend in the computer lab because she was all alone and it was late and the security guard said no problem I'll make sure she's okay. The next morning when Kurt woke up he heard rumors from other students on campus about a woman's body being found just outside of Randall Hall and that apparently it looked like murder. Kurt said he didn't think much of it at first but that day when he went into campus to meet up with Debbie he saw her car still parked in the computer lab parking lot looking like it had never left. And then when he got to the meeting site, Debbie never showed. And he said it was at that point that he realized the dead woman in Randall Hall must be Debbie. And he wasn't wrong, it was Debbie, but the police were not buying his story. He was the last person to see Debbie alive, and by his own admonition, he had heard that morning about a dead woman being found at Randall Hall, the very place he had left his girlfriend the night before all alone. But it took him hours to bring this up to anyone. The police also noticed he had bruises on his knuckles and a deep cut between his fingers. Suddenly, Kurt seemed like the killer. And this crime that initially looked like a robbery gone wrong now looked like something much more personal. Strangulation is intimate. The killer almost always is face to face with their victim. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of rage. And afterwards, the killer had covered Debbie's body with her jacket, an act that indicated remorse or even respect. And investigators know that generally when a woman is murdered, her romantic partner is the culprit. Instead of tipping off Kurt that they were looking at him as the primary suspect, they told him to go back to his dorm room and they would be in touch with him as the investigation developed. In the meantime, investigators turned their attention to the computer lab in Randall Hall, where Kurt said Debbie had been last. Debbie had logged into a computer at the front of the lab, but had not logged out. Her computer cursor was left blinking mid-sentence at 1.38 a.m., leading investigators to believe she was interrupted by her attacker inside of the lab. Investigators found two extension cords on the ground near this computer that matched the ligature marks on Debbie's neck. They also found a small spot of blood on the back of Debbie's chair that they sent off for testing. As police swept the computer lab, they began commenting on how neat everything looked, considering that there must have been some sort of death struggle that took place in there. And that's when they realized there had been a huge setback in this case. The janitor that morning had cleaned the computer lab and the hall right outside, likely destroying critical physical evidence. 
They interviewed the janitor who had a rock solid alibi and was incredibly remorseful at unintentionally destroying the crime scene. And so they asked the janitor before you cleaned it up, was there anything strange about the computer lab or the hallway right outside of the computer lab? And the janitor said, no, it was all normal, but she did say it looked like the tables and chairs had been moved around inside of the computer lab, but it didn't stand out to her because it always looked that way when she went in to clean it up. Because the police lacked physical evidence, they couldn't just go arrest Kurt, even though they wanted to. And so instead, they asked him if he'd be willing to come down to the station for a formal interview, and he said he would. During the interview, Kurt insisted he had nothing to do with Debbie's death. As for the bruises and cut on his hand, he said he had punched a wall after finding out what had happened to Debbie, and the cut in the middle of his fingers was from working on his car. But neither of those things could be proven. After this interview yielded no new results, and they still had no evidence on Kurt, they told him he could go, and in the interim, they began digging into his alibi. Kurt had previously told police that after leaving Debbie in the computer lab, on his walk back to his dorm, he had passed a security guard and asked that security guard to check on Debbie. And so the police were able to track down that security guard who confirmed Kurt's alibi. The security guard's name was Bryce Clapman, who was a longtime employee of Drexel University with a stellar work record and no criminal history. Clapman said he spoke with Kurt around 1.30 in the morning as Kurt was walking back towards the dorms. After speaking with Kurt, Clapman radioed Bronson Ziegler, who was one of the two security guards that were working in Randall Hall that night, and he told him that he or the other guy, David Dixon, would need to go down into the basement and check on this girl. Shortly after radioing Ziegler, Clapman would say he saw a person, presumably a student, come out of Randall Hall. He said he was just too far away and it was too dark that he couldn't make out any features, but he definitely saw someone walking around the premise around 1.30 in the morning. Clapman told police he never stepped foot inside of Randall Hall that night and that he was willing to take a lie detector test. Police ran the backgrounds of Bronson Ziegler and David Dixon. Dixon was a military veteran with a pristine record who was still in the Army Reserves. As for Ziegler, he had spent time in jail for burglary and had actually lied about it to get his job as a security guard. When police interviewed Ziegler, he was evasive and frustrated, and he said that he did receive the message from Clapman to go check on the girl, but he didn't feel like doing it himself, so he radioed Dixon and said he should go do it. Ziegler insisted he had done his rounds properly and he had never stepped foot inside of the computer lab. He told detectives they could check his security guard clock that he carried with him every time he did rounds, which was basically like a punch card where there was designated stations along his security rounds where he would punch this card that stamped a time that he had arrived at that station. And so over the course of the night, he would punch his card at each of these stations, and there was a record of what time he arrived and what time he left. And so when they checked this record, it showed that Ziegler had hit all the stations at the correct time. But that didn't mean he didn't kill her, because there was lots of time in between rounds that he could have attacked her. Towards the end of the interview, Ziegler accused detectives of messing with him, and then he sarcastically said he had killed Debbie, and then he refused to take a lie detector test. When the police interviewed Dixon, he said that Ziegler had never radioed him him, asking him to check on the girl in the computer lab. However, he did say he was aware of someone working late in the computer lab because around 2.15 in the morning, he had walked past and the lights were on and he heard the sound of printers working inside. And so not wanting to disturb whoever was in there, he didn't even poke his head in. He just figured he would come back in a couple hours and make sure they were gone. And so over the next couple of hours, he chatted on the phone with his girlfriend. And then around four in the morning, he went back down to the computer lab and the lights were off and the door was locked. And so he figured, who Whoever had been in there had finished up and left, and Ziegler had locked up after them. When asked why he or Ziegler had not discovered Debbie's body, he said their security rounds did not leave the building, and so that stairwell was considered outside of the building, and so they never would have seen her. At this point, Clapman and Dixon were ruled out as suspects, but Ziegler became a primary suspect. But just as with the boyfriend, Kurt Rayner, there was no physical evidence tying Ziegler to the crime, and so they couldn't arrest him. Investigators decided instead to try to track down that person Clapman had seen walking around Randall Hall around 1.30 in the morning after speaking with Kurt and after radioing Ziegler. It would turn out to be 28-year-old PhD student Ashlyn Bearhard, who was known for keeping long hours and was also known for sneaking up behind the female secretaries that worked in his office and suddenly holding a pencil up to their neck and threatening to kill them. His office also happened to be directly above where Debbie's body was ultimately found inside of that stairwell. When interviewed by police, Ashland said he had been in Randall Hall the night Debbie had been killed, but didn't know Debbie, had no interaction with her, and didn't leave his office the whole night. He quickly agreed to take a lie detector test, but he failed it. Scrambling to explain it, he named two other students that were in the office with him that could be his alibi. 
But when police spoke to these two other students, they said, no, Ashlyn was not in the office the whole time. He left around one in the morning and was gone for about three hours. He said he was going to take a nap. When the police approached Ashlyn with this information, he said, oh, you know what? I forgot to tell you about my nap. Yes, I left for a few hours. I stepped outside for a breath of fresh air, went back inside and slept in one of the study hall rooms. But besides that, I was inside of that building for a full 24 hours and I never saw Debbie. I had no interaction with her. It's just coincidence that my nap coincided with when she was killed. But detectives were not buying it. They believed wholeheartedly that now, finally, they had found their killer. But just like with Kurt and with Ziegler, they had no physical evidence tying Ashlyn to the crime, and so they couldn't arrest him. And because they were not able to make any arrests, the police just continued to look for more suspects. And so they began speaking to some of Debbie's friends and acquaintances, and it came out that Debbie actually had a stalker. It was another student named Alan Smith, who had previously been one of Debbie's very close friends, but at some point he wanted to take the relationship from platonic to romantic, and Debbie rejected him. Alan apparently didn't take this very well and took to following Debbie around campus, trying to get her to stop and talk to him and try to reconcile their relationship, but Debbie every time would just say no, and Alan got increasingly more angry about it, and just the day before Debbie was killed, their friends saw Debbie fighting with Alan in the middle of campus where Alan had actually grabbed her shoulder and was shaking her and yelling at her. Police tracked down Alan, and he was cooperative and said he did not kill Debbie, but he didn't have an alibi. He just said he was alone in his apartment on the night that Debbie was killed. And so like all the other primary suspects in this case, there was no physical evidence tying Alan to the crime, and so so they couldn't make an arrest. Around this time, the lab that tested the blood spatter that was on Debbie's chair inside of the computer lab came back with their results. DNA profiling was not available back then, so all they could provide was blood type. The blood type that came back from that little spot was type A, and Debbie's blood was type O, meaning this blood spot likely belonged to Debbie's killer, who during their struggle must have gotten wounded and then bled on the chair. And so right away, the police got Kurt Rayner, Bronson Ziegler, Ashlyn Bearhard, and Alan Smith to all come in and provide a blood sample, and they figured if any one of them was type A, that they probably were the killer. But unbelievably, when their test results came back in, none of them were type A. It was a crushing blow to the investigation. The first few days after Debbie's killing seemed so full of promising leads, but now with this blood type development, investigators had no suspects, and all of a sudden, the Drexel community was starting to panic. Students were outraged at the light security and wondered why the security guards were not allowed to carry weapons. The administration put up a $10,000 reward for any information about who could have done this. And the president of the university told students to use the buddy system and never be alone on campus because he believed the killer was one of us. No one could understand why anyone would want to target Debbie in the first place. She seemed like such a wonderful person that was nice to everyone. She had modeled in high school, but she wasn't vain. She'd actually turned down getting braces because she was worried it might affect her clarinet playing. She was an average student, but she had an uncommon drive. She worked really hard to get good grades. Whenever she was feeling down or wasn't feeling motivated, she would stare at a picture of a Mercedes-Benz car that was there to inspire her and remind her what she could achieve if she continued to work hard. When she was killed, that picture of the Mercedes-Benz still hung above her desk. It was ultimately her work ethic that put her in danger because she was prepared to stay at that computer lab as long as it took to make sure her project was perfect. The few pieces of physical evidence the police had didn't fit together. The crime wasn't really a robbery. While she was missing her shoes and socks, her backpack had turned up at the campus lost and found about a week later, and no one knows how it got there or who put it there. Inside, it appeared all of her belongings were still there. Also, when she was discovered, she was still wearing her expensive watch. Her murder looked personal, but the police could not prove that someone who actually knew her was the one who killed her. Police considered a few other suspects, but like all the others, there wasn't enough evidence to make any arrests, and so eventually Debbie's case went cold. In 1985, the Philadelphia Inquirer ran a story about unsolved cases that most haunted detectives, and Debbie's was one of them. Some of the detectives that were involved in the case said they believed this was a random killing and that the killer would most likely strike again. Debbie's case eventually disappeared from headlines and it languished for eight years. And then in the spring of 1992, Debbie's murder was assigned to a cold case squad led by Detective Bob Snyder. And desperate to crack the case, Snyder threw 
through a Hail Mary. He took the case to the VDOC Society, which is a private and highly selective club of geniuses from all walks of criminology. Homicide detectives, prosecutors, defense attorneys, FBI agents, forensic scientists, even an aeronautic physicist. They came from all over the world for these monthly closed door sessions where they would talk about these unsolvable cases and try to solve them. So in one of their monthly closed door sessions, Detective Snyder stood in front of the VDOC Society and laid out the details of Debbie Wilson's murder. Then he opened the floor to questions and for hours the society got nowhere. Then Richard Walter, who was a founding member of the society, said that he had a theory. Walter was a famous criminal psychologist who had profiled some of the world's most infamous killers. Most of his work is actually still confidential. He believed the killer was a power assertive macho type guy that liked being in control. Walter pointed to one clue that detectives and everyone seemed to have overlooked after all these years, and that was Debbie's missing shoes. He said the missing shoes were not random. They were the most important clue. The killer, Walter predicted, was a foot fetishist. Detective Snyder had nothing else to go on and he was really intrigued by this idea. So he brought the information back to the cold case squad and they began re-interviewing everybody involved in the case. When they spoke with the manager of the computer lab at Randall Hall, he told them he was always bothered by one particular detail. The printers in the lab always turned off after 10 p.m. And so he was always confused how the security guard, David Dixon, could have heard the sound of printers inside the lab at 2.15 in the morning, like he claimed. Detectives were shocked. Somehow no one had picked up on this discrepancy. They began looking more closely at David Dixon, who had been ruled out as a suspect and was viewed by and large as this pristine military veteran with no criminal history. And they dug all the way to the back of his military file where they discovered in 1979, the first year he was in the service, he had gotten in trouble for stealing another soldier's white Reebok sneakers, the exact type of shoe that Debbie was known to wear. Police began interviewing Dixon's former and current neighbors, and at least four women reported having a break-in when Dixon was living next to them, and the only thing missing was their white sneakers and dirty socks. Although none of these women actually ever found out who was responsible. When they raided Dixon's apartment, they found in one of his closets 20 sets of used women's white shoes that were all wrapped in plastic like they were trophies. They also found 77 homemade videos, presumably shot by Dixon, that are just filming the feet of women walking around in white shoes. Dixon's alibi on the night that Debbie was killed was that most of the time he was on the phone with his girlfriend. His girlfriend had become his wife and then she became his ex-wife. And so when detectives spoke to her, she told them that they had only spoke for a couple of minutes that night, not for a couple of hours. Police arrested Dixon in June of 1993 and he never admitted to anything, but as soon as he got into his cell, he started bragging to his cellmate about how he had killed Debbie because he wanted to have his way with her feet. And his cellmate immediately told on him. Dixon was ultimately found guilty of killing Debbie Wilson and he was sentenced to life in prison. So that's gonna do it guys. After numerous reports that LaToya Ammons was mistreating her children, based on reports that she gave, she was telling police that demons were throwing her kids around the house. Based on those reports, Child Protective Services was sent to do a home study to go to their house, go to LaToya Ammons' house, and make sure it was a safe, clean place for children to be living. In addition to the case manager, her name was Valerie Washington, who was gonna be going over to do this home study, the Lake County Sheriff Department also sent over Lieutenant Gruska, who would be assisting Valerie and watching the home study take place. When Gruska arrives at the house, he is met with Valerie Washington, also LaToya Ammons, the mother, and her two sons, Andrew, who's nine, and Amante, who's seven, as well as LaToya's mother, so the boy's grandmother. Her name was Rosa. Washington, the case manager, pulls Gruska aside out of earshot of LaToya and her family, and she starts telling Gruska about what happened at the hospital eight days earlier, because she, 
the case manager had already begun investigating Latoya Ammons and that whole situation with her kids. Eight days earlier, Washington was at the hospital sitting in a waiting room. Washington was with a psychologist and they were speaking to Rosa, who was the grandmother of these children. In the room was also Andrew, the oldest son, and Amante, the youngest son. And as they're chatting, Amante, the youngest son, stands up and walks to the middle of the waiting room. And his eyes roll back into his skull, and he begins emitting this growling sound that sounded too deep for a boy of seven years old. The grandmother reacted to it like she had seen it before. She got right up, she marched over to him, and she took him by the hands, and she yelled, you are not you. And she kept saying that and the boy's eyes are still back in his head and he's not responding to anything his grandmother's saying. As Rosa is repeating over and over again, you are not you, Amante begins backpedaling towards a wall behind him. And Rosa holds his hands the whole time. She's holding his hands firmly. He gets to the wall and instead of stopping, he puts his foot up against the wall. This is a seven-year-old boy and begins walking up the wall by pressing against Rosa. And she's holding on tight and he's pressing back at her and using that weight to walk backwards up the wall. The psychologist in Washington are just watching in disbelief. Rosa's holding on to him as he walks all the way up to where he's on his tippy toes on the wall. And then he flips forward in front of her and lands on his feet on the other side of Rosa. The psychologist and Washington literally run out of the room and they go get a doctor and they explain what happened. The doctor comes in, not having any clue what to make of this and just says to the boy, can you do that again? And Amante at this point, his eyes are back to normal and he's sitting now next to Rosa. And he says, what, I didn't do anything. And acted like he had not been walking up the walls. Now it's not in the report how Lieutenant Gruska responds to Washington's story about the hospital. However, the entire police report that I'm pulling all this information from is written by Lieutenant Gruska at the end of the investigation. So this exchange between he and the case manager, Washington, about the hospital visit that he was not part of, it apparently carried weight in the entire investigation that he felt compelled to add it into the report. Even though on paper, you would think if you're doing a home study for this house, why would you incorporate something that didn't have anything to do with the house? It gives you maybe an insight into Lieutenant Gruska, although his language remains super professional and very pragmatic, that perhaps Lieutenant Gruska at the end of this investigation was starting to think this might be paranormal. After this story, two more police officers show up to the house to assist with this home study. One was Brian Miller and the other was Charles Austin. At this point, the three officers, Gruska, Miller, and Austin, along with the case manager, Washington, begin walking towards the family and towards the front door of the house. Latoya says that she and her kids will not go back in the house because they had moved out very recently because of the strangeness that they claim was happening inside of the house. They felt like they were under attack by demons. And so the police, they needed someone to bring them in. And so Rosa, the grandmother, Latoya's mother, she offered to go in with them. So the house is a single story, three bedroom house. You walk in and you're inside of the screened in porch. You go into the main level. There's a few bedrooms and then there's a stairwell that leads down into the basement. And so they go in and Lieutenant Gruska is in charge of taking pictures and recording audio the whole time they're in the house. They were not aware that they had already moved out. So it's a bit of an awkward home study because they're not even living there anymore. But either way, they're gonna do their job. They're walking around, taking pictures of each of the bedrooms. There's three bedrooms, there's a kitchen, basic stuff upstairs. And then they go downstairs to the basement. Now, the basement was where Latoya and her family claimed the majority of the paranormal activity was taking place. The steps leading down to the basement were wood. They went down into the basement. The basement floor was concrete and the walls were concrete blocks. As they go down, Lieutenant Gruska would notice that there were candles that had been placed all over the basement floor that had burned down to their wick. There was also an altar and a nativity scene that had been placed near the underside of the stairs. And so when Gruska goes over to take pictures of the altar and the nativity scene, he recognizes that under the stairs, near where those two things are placed, it's all dirt. 
the concrete that made up the floor of the basement had been broken away and there was jagged pieces of concrete where there should have been a continuous flow of concrete underneath the steps. It had been snapped up and broken away. It was gone. When Rosa was questioned about the strangeness of the basement with all the candles and the altar, she just said that there's a presence down here and that's all she was able to articulate. The other officers and the case manager and Rosa, they go back upstairs and Lieutenant Gruzka and Charles Austin, the other officer, they stay in the basement and take a few extra pictures, a couple more underneath the stairs and just of the candles before they ultimately go upstairs as well. When Gruzka comes upstairs, Rosa's waiting for him and she's about to turn the light off leading down into the basement and she asks him, did you get any pictures underneath the stairs? And he said, yeah. Yeah, I did. I stayed down there. I took some more pictures. She looks at him and she says, sometimes at night when we're sleeping on the main floor, we'll hear commotion in the basement. It sounds like maybe someone bumping on the underside of the stairs. And then you hear footsteps walking up the wood steps and whatever it is stops on the other side of the door leading into the main floor and it will stay there for hours. We're too scared to open the door to look. Gruzka goes back to his office and he immediately uploads the pictures that he took with a focus on the ones he took in the basement. And he finds that there is a couple pictures he took under the stairs that in the right hand corner of the picture, just behind one of the steps, it's partially obscured, is a white mist or a white cloud. And he zooms in on it and he brings in other officers and they look at it. And if you zoom in close enough, it looks like a man's face. As they're zoomed in on this mist underneath the stairs, they can see only because they've zoomed in that there appears to be a faint green mist on the left side of the picture. It appears to be a woman's face. Gruzka and Austin, who were the only two in the basement at the time of these pictures taken, swear they did not see a white or green mist under the stairs when they took pictures. Gruzka, again, it doesn't say in the report how he's feeling, but you can imagine he's starting to feel a little bit uneasy about what he's witnessing. Gruzka just goes to his audio recording. And so he fast forwards to the section where he and Austin are alone in the basement taking these additional photos. And you can clearly hear on the recording, Gruzka and Austin talking to each other as they're taking these pictures. And at some point as they're taking these pictures of the basement, a third voice, not Austin, not Gruzka, say directly into the audio recorder, Hey! The audio recorder was one that Gruzka was used to using and it had never malfunctioned before. And he and Austin were the only ones down there. And so they couldn't explain where the third voice was coming from and neither could any of the other officers who listened to it. On April 30th, Gruzka set up a meeting with Latoya Ammon's priest, who she was very close with. They were regular church goers. This priest, his name was Father Maginot, he had been at the Ammon's residence five days before this home visit was done, when Latoya Ammons and her family was still living in that residence. And so Gruzka went to interview him to get a sense of what it was like when they were still living there. Father Maginot said he was there because Latoya had reached out and said, I don't know what to do because she's claiming there are demons here. And while they're sitting in the living room on the main floor, Father Maginot is telling Gruzka that the bathroom light started flickering on and off. And so it was distracting enough that ultimately Father Maginot got up and walked over to the bathroom. And as soon as he went inside, the flickering stopped. And then he'd go back down and sit down and it would start again. Repeatedly, Father Maginot would get up when it was flickering. He would go in and it would stop. He'd come back and it would start flickering again. So while this is happening and Father Maginot is going back and forth to the bathroom, trying to figure out why the light is flickering, Latoya points out that a liquid is forming on one of the window blinds in the room that they were all sitting in. There was this oily liquid substance that was just kind of trickling down the window blinds. And Father Magina walks over and looks at it. They're all looking at it and there's no leak in the ceiling. There's no source for this liquid and it hadn't been there before. At least that's what Latoya Ammons and her family is saying that that's not from us. We don't know what that is. As they're looking at this oily substance on the blinds, the cord that controls the blind itself starts swaying back and forth. 
and everyone's startled as they're looking at it because there's no draft in the room, the window's not open, there's no reason it should be swaying. While they're looking at this cord, Father Maginot looks down and sees this huge footprint in the carpet near where they're standing that was too big to be his, and nobody else in the house had a footprint that was that big. At this point, Father Maginot doesn't think it's safe for the family to be there and advises her to leave. And this would actually be the episode that prompts Latoya Ammons and her family to leave the house and not come back. On May 10th, Lieutenant Gruska, a new Child Protective Services case manager and a host of police officers go back to the Ammons residence. The Ammons residence has been unoccupied with all utilities shut off, locked and sealed since the last time they were there, which was on April 27th. So it's a two week period that no one has been in the house, but there is a customary follow-up to this house. They had to as part of the home study. When Lieutenant Gruska arrives at the property, outside is Father Machino, as well as Latoya Ammons, her mother, Rosa, Latoya's two sons, Andrew and Amante, as well as a host of police officers. There's a canine unit that's there. Although it's not said explicitly in the report, it would appear that the reason there's all this additional police presence in a canine unit is because there's enough weirdness being reported about the house. There could be you know, a home invasion situation happening, that somebody else is living in this house, any number of things could be happening, but they can't write off all of the strange testimony about what's happening in the house. And so before they go in for this second home study, they have one of the dogs from the canine unit go into the property and search the property for intruders, just in case this was a home invasion or something like that. They wanted to just check the box. So they send the dog in, the dog comes out, hasn't found anything unusual. And so the police, along with Father Maginot, the case manager, and Rosa, they go back into the house. The main level looked untouched. There was nothing strange happening in the main level when they walked around, nothing was disturbed. It looked like no one had been here in two weeks. So they open the door to the basement, they turn on the light, and a couple weird things happen right away. One, they noticed that on the steps, on the wooden steps leading into the basement, there is an oily substance with no clear origin that goes all the way down the steps, snakes around the side and disappears underneath the stairs. As they begin walking down the stairs, the case manager from Child Protective Services happens to touch a cabinet that had been built into the walls along the stairwell leading down into the basement. And immediately she pulls her hand back. And she grabs her pinky and she reacts like something had hurt her. And they ask, hey, what's going on? And she's like, I don't know, I just touched the cabinet and, and my hand now hurts, my pinky hurts, it's tingling. And it apparently had turned white. We don't have any images to show that, but her, her pinky basically had been wounded just from touching this cabinet. And so the officers go down into the basement and they follow this oily trail that goes back under the stairs. And they're thinking to themselves, all the utilities have been turned off. There's no reason there should be any water down here. Not to mention there's no origin for this oily substance and no one's been in the house for the past two weeks. So we can't even account for this by saying that one of the family members might have spilled something. And so even though it's not written into the report that they were scared or that they were considering this could be beyond rational explanation, it's clear from what happens next that everybody there was ready to explore the idea that something was happening underneath the steps because now the family's claimed there's been something crawling out of there and walking up the stairs at night. You have the strange oily substance coming from the underside of the stairs. You have the, the white and the green apparition inside of the pictures. Father Magino suggested that if there was a, some sort of demonic possession happening in the house, that there's a good chance they would find things underneath the steps that were tied to the family. And so they decide they're gonna dig up the dirt underneath the steps. And so Gruska begins digging into this, this dirt patch under the steps. And he makes it about two feet down and he finds a press on pink fingernail. He also finds women's underwear. And as he keeps digging, he finds a political pin, like for your t-shirt. He also finds the lid to one of the cooking pots from upstairs. He continues to dig and he finds some trash and miscellaneous papers. And it dawns on the group that someone or something is leaving the basement, going into the main section of the house, taking things from the family, going back downstairs, going underneath the steps and burying them. And probably has been for some time. And so at some point they stopped being able to dig any farther. The soil was too hard. So they 
put the soil back and decide to leave the house. As they're leaving the house, Rosa is the last one to leave and she actually says, hey, come over here. And she's standing in that screened in porch and she's looking up at the, the window blinds. On the window blinds in the house is that same, or it appeared to be the same oily substance trickling down the blinds that matched the description of what Father Maginot had said he had seen when he was visiting the family before and saw liquid coming down the blinds. And so the officers reacted to this by saying, Rosa, did you do this? Are you responsible for putting this liquid on the blinds? And she said, no, there was no clear source for this liquid. There was no leak, there was nothing. And so Lieutenant Ruska wipes the liquid off of the blinds and tells everyone to leave the house. For 25 minutes, they waited. And then they went back inside to see if there was gonna be liquid there, and there was. And Father Maginot would say that after that first time he was there and he saw the liquid dripping down, he did some research. And it's very common over the history of time that if there's any sort of demonic possession in a house, that liquids will ooze from different areas in the house. And it's this oily substance that matches the description of what they just saw. At this point, Lieutenant Gruska and the police tell everyone to vacate the premise. They lock it up and they leave. And that is the end of the police report. Although not included in this police report where I pulled all of the story from, Charles Austin, who was the other officer who was in the basement with Lieutenant Gruska when they were taking pictures underneath the steps and they heard that voice on the recorder, well, Charles Austin actually worked for another police department, the Hammond Police Department, and he took some pictures of the outside of this house during the time that no one was staying at the house. And one of the official police pictures shows a shadowy figure standing in the screened in porch of this house right near where that liquid was dripping down the blinds. In 2014, Zach Bagans, who's a popular paranormal investigator, he hosts the show Ghost Adventures. He purchased the Demon House and filmed a documentary that he called The Demon House. And you can check that out for yourself. And he demolished the house in 2016. So I'd love to get your opinion on this story because I told it based on information that was available in official police documentation. Now that doesn't mean that it was paranormal, that this house was haunted, that there were demons there, but it at least makes you wonder what was really happening in that house. If you enjoyed this story, then please, if you would, kindly take the like button out for a nice seafood dinner and then never call it again, and then subscribe to my channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly three to four, even five video uploads that sound an awful lot like what you just heard. If you wanna get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram. My handle is johnballin416. I'm also very active on TikTok where my handle is Mr. Ballin. So whether I see you on TikTok, Instagram, or YouTube, or some combination of those, I'm just very thankful for your support. And until next time, see you guys.